Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, that's that's the last slide, not the first slide. Um, all right, so today's lab, we're going to focus on um, on how do we actually build molecules digitally that have the right the right shapes and the right geometries. So we're going to be um, focusing on on using a couple different what are called coordinate systems um, and the the simplest coordinate system which you're most used to um we'll we'll talk at, let me let me skip forward we'll talk about programs first um so the the program that i recommended at the end of class today um is it's free it's developed by a group out of i want to say it's iowa state um that uh, it's a very commonly used free program for building molecules um, called MacMol PLT. It's got a, a visual uh, graphical user interface or GUI. Um, the other programs we'll wind up using, um, Notepad++ is we're gonna wind up actually um, writing some some um, calculations, not doing the calculation, but setting the calculations up. Um, in note in Notepad or Notepad plus plus is the version I recommend. There's two. There's another one on here that is or that's uh, referenced on the um, on the lab sheet called Brackets that works for for uh, Max. Um, but they're basically the text editors that are that run a lot lighter than Microsoft Word or Google Docs. And they also, they don't do much in the way of formatting. They're designed for programmers or people that need to just edit text documents quickly and keep them organized. Um, so I highly recommend these. You can use, you can use um, anything that will edit a document file, anything that'll edit a text file um, for this. These are just the two versions that I find work the best. Um, that's all you really need for this lab. Uh, the other, the other programs that are referenced in the um, in the lab slides, Win Games is actually going to be the program we use to run the calculations, but we're going to run it on a separate um, server that's run out of Sonoma State, so you don't actually have to install anything here, which is good because. Um, if you think dealing with Mac install versus PC install install is tricky, Win Games is really, really tricky. You have to update various binaries and packages, um, save things in just the right spot, go in and edit text documents that then are going to get referenced by the program. Um, it's a big hassle. If you're if you're into computers and have experience with that, then then you could actually install games on your own personal computer, um, but it's not it's not easy, uh, and it's not one size fits all. Um, so we will not install that ourselves. We will use that program, and I can't even remember what game stands for, despite the fact that I've I used it for um, nonstop for five years of my life. Um, the, the last one that we're going to wind up using is Excel, and that's going to be basically to take our data from our calculations and actually analyze it and turn it into things like potential energy surfaces and graphs. Um, so you guys are all fairly familiar with Excel at this point. Um, the new program we're focusing on today is that MacMole PLT. Right, and so the, the lab write-up has um, a, some good background and some good figures as well. Um, so I'm gonna present it the, on the slides so that then you can see some slightly different figures. It might help us stick in your head a little bit better. Um, so th what these programs are actually doing, what Win Games actually does is it basically um, takes inform takes information that you give it like the charge on a nucleus and how many electrons are in a system and it basically just uses the 
functions that represent the various atomic orbitals and it kind of mixes them together in a way to try and find the lowest energy possible state because whatever the lowest energy state is for all of these different electrons that's got to be closest to the actual shape of those orbitals so what we're actually doing is is we're using a, a computer to um, find a solution to schrodinger's equation remember schrodinger's equation was um, the simple version of it was h hat times the wave function is equal to the energy as a function of the wave function so all this hamiltonian is is basically says that okay if you know where what the shape of the various orbitals are you can predict what the energy of that system is and so by plugging in different values for the wave function and the wave function is the the sum of all of the different mole, uh, electronic orbitals um so if you know what the wave function is you can actually run a calculation on that wave function and get the energy of that system. So that's all well and good. That's pretty abstract and high level without actually doing any, showing any of the math that, that's actually going to go into this. But basically what it does is it lets us find the lowest energy system and therefore what, what the orbitals actually are shaped like and what the energy of that, those orbitals are. So that's how we can actually generate things like a potential energy surface for a particular reaction. We can look at what the reactants look like and find their best, their most stable geometry. Then we can look at what the transition state looks like and figure out what the transition state's energy is. And by comparing the two, that allows us to predict what the activation energy is. The energy of the transition state minus the energy of the state of the reactants, that difference is your activation energy. Right? So in order to do any of that, though, we have to give the program enough information. We have to tell the program what nuclei we have, how many electrons we have, and where all the nuclei are. And the program takes that information and then it, it says, okay, if I've got all of these different orbitals, how can I arrange them best based on where the nuclei are and how many nuclei are there? So the first step in being able to run any of those calculations is you have to be able to tell the computer where the atoms are. And so that's what I'm what is um what i'm referring to when i say creating geometries or writing the geometries of these molecules is what is your starting point where are all the nuclei and what's the overall charge on the system so we're going to use every molecule is going to have its own unique geometry um and the reason we need to have those is so that we can numerically not just like you know give a rough drawing or say it's sp3 we need to numerically say this is the exact point where this atom is where the nuclei is because how close the nuclei are to each other is going to affect what the different energies of the orbitals are um, it also is going to allow us to state our overall charge of the system and the multiplicity of the system multiplicity is a quantum mechanical term that basically means how many un what's the overall spin of the system so if all of your electrons are paired your spin is always going to be zero right because for every electron that spin up you've got a matching electron that spin down so that would give us a multiplicity of zero and that's almost always going to be the case um but that again that's something that we need to tell the calculation to tell the program uh, no, why don't you play Legos or something else? You don't need to watch TV. His mom and his sister just went to pick up groceries, and so he was seizing this opportunity to pick his cartoons. Um, a brief tangent. I have to say Disney Plus is really interesting because it allows me to relive my childhood cartoons. All of the 90s Spider-Man X-Men cartoons are on Disney Plus now, and he's getting into them, which is 
very entertaining to see just how bad the animation was in the 90s and how bad the dialogue was. Um, but they all have, have cartoons like Gargoyles, which was one of my favorites when I was a kid. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, the last thing that's really helpful about these geometries is it allows us to, to add constraints, meaning it allows us to, to make um, specific constants within the geometry. So it allows us to do something like, okay, the distance between these two atoms has to stay at 1.3 angstroms or whatever the distance is. Um, it allows, or phrase a bond angle. We can say, okay, whatever, whatever happens, whatever other atoms are moving around, don't let these two carbons get closer than 120 degrees. Um, and so that allows us some really interesting ways that we can study things like, okay, this it's one way that we can study things like strain energy, because we can say, okay, well, what happens to the energy as we force these carbon atoms closer than they want to be? Um, there are a couple, there are two various or two, two different systems for communicating all this information. Um, and the, the simplest, the simplest of these um, is actually just using Cartesian coordinates. So Cartesian coordinates, uh, if you haven't had math in a while, that's just X, Y, and Z. So X and Y would be a two-dimensional Cartesian plot. You got the X axis and the Y axis, and you just say, go over this far in the X direction, then up this far in the Y direction. If you want to have it in three dimensions, then that's, that's still Cartesian coordinates. You just add the Z axis. So if you think of, of your piece of paper being X and Y, Z would be sticking perpendicularly out of the paper. Right, or if we're drawing it on a, on the on a whiteboard, you can have. Let's see, if this is your x-axis, this is your y-axis. The z-axis would be going perpendicular to the plane that these are. So this would be drawing a plane that's basically straight into the board and, and out of the board. And that's your X, Y plane. And then your Z sticks up straight from there. So if you had a, a, um, a specific set of coordinates, so for instance, if I say, okay, there's a carbon atom at, I don't know, one, two, three, but well, there's your X coordinate, your Y coordinate and your Z coordinate. You may not have seen this in math in recent years, but um, if you want, wanted to plot that, you'd say, okay, go one unit in the X direction, then go two units in the Y direction, and then one, two, three. So you'd be going up. So this would be the point, one, two, three in three dimensions. So that's all Cartesian coordinates are show, are giving us is saying, okay, if you've got an X, Y, Z coordinate system, X is um, how far that direction, Y is then you take take a turn, go 90 degrees from where you were headed, were headed in the X direction. And then Z is you go straight up from that plane or straight down if it was a negative. Um, so if we wanted to do another one, if we said negative two, one, negative two. So one, two, there's your negative two in the X direction. In your Y direction, go positive one. Then your Z direction, if your Z direction is negative two, that means you're going one, so so you've got this flat surface sticking in and out and then you go down two units to get here right so 
I'm not going to spend a ton of time on Cartesian systems because you've seen it before, even if it was briefly or a long time ago. Um, and they're, they're not all that useful when it comes to actually building a geometry out. If you want to actually show where a molecule is, so where the, all the nuclei of a molecule are, this is really, really clunky, right? Because you have to individually state where every single atom is. And then you would have to go in there and plot it out in three dimensions for every single atom. And back before we had, had graphical, you know, mouse, mice, um, and, uh, and, you know, easy graphical user interfaces, you actually had to do this on a piece of graph paper. Um, and plot these by hand. You could get the com a computer to run these calculations, but then you had to draw your molecule by hand um, because we didn't have the graphical power on a computer to be able to show it in three dimensions. Um, so not super useful because it winds up being looking like a mess. If we look at the optimized structure for ethanol, say, ethanol is a pretty simple molecule as far as what we've been looking at, right? But the Cartesian coordinates for ethanol wind up looking like this. Um, and so these various columns, the first column is just what the what type of atom it is. So carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. The second column is what's the charge on the nucleus? How many protons are in the nucleus? So these two columns are always going to be linked up. If you put a carbon here, you've got to put a six there. Um, but then these other columns are x, y, and z. So you would be going in 0 0.02 units in the x direction, negative 0 0.002 units in the y direction, and then negative 0 0.068 units in the x direction, um, just to get something that looks like this molecule here. Um, so it's easiest. It's a pain, but it's not complicated to use once you get the hang of it. I, I'm kind of contradicting myself. It's complicated, might be a, a, the wrong word to use. Um, it's easiest to put into implementation to actually use this process, but it results in a very clunky overall system to actually plot anything by hand, if that makes sense. So it's, it's sort of the equivalent of, um, you know, doing a bunch of algebra to get one nice neat equation at the end versus doing all the algebra or not doing any algebra, plugging everything in at the beginning and you wind up with a, just a mess of arithmetic that you have to walk through. That might be simpler to do that mess of arithmetic, but if you put in the work to actually do it the other way, it's a lot more elegant. Cartesian coordinates are not elegant at all. They're not, there's nothing about them um, that is easy to use. They're simple to use, but not easy to use. It's maybe that's the best way to phrase it. Um, they do allow us to do things like we can just say, okay, whatever happens, don't move this carbon. So we can freeze coordinates, but we, we can't freeze a bond length very well. Um, the other, another pro of Cartesian coordinates is that they're universal. Every program, there's a lot of different programs out there that will run these type of calculations. They all can use Cartesian coordinates just fine because computers think in Cartesian coordinates just fine. Um, they're really hard to build your own by hand, though. If you actually wanted to do this, there's a lot, a mess of trigonometry and Pythagorean um, calculations to figure out exactly where these carbons would have to be relative to each other. So with this in mind, um, some of the early computational chemists uh, developed a different coordinate system, which they call Z-matrix coordinates. And Z-matrix coordinates define everything in relative to other atoms. Instead of having some arbitrary, some arbitrary um, X, Y, Z grid where everything is relative to the origin, Z matrix coordinates um, are all relative to whatever the first atom is. You just say, okay, my first atom is a carbon. Boom. 
my and then your next line is going to be telling you where a hydrogen is relative to the carbon. So this this winds up being a lot easier to actually build your molecules this way because um, it allows us, once we know what these various columns are, it allows us a lot of power and, and we're able to be very, very specific about where things are. So column one, once again, is the atom type. So just carbon or hydrogen or oxygen. Column two is going to define a bond length, a distance between your second atom and whatever atom you reference here. So in row two, we're defining a new atom, which is a hydrogen. We're saying it's going to be relative to atom one it's 1.9 angstroms away. So remember, angstrom is a, is a distance unit in chemistry. This is convenient for talking about how large atoms are. Um, and so we can just plug in. If you know the average bond length of a carbon-hydrogen bond, or if you look it up and you find that it's 1.09 angstroms is the average distance between car from carbon to hydrogen, then you can say, OK, I've got a hydrogen. Relative to atom one, it's 1.09 angstroms away. So what that tells, tells us, if we were actually filling this in, row one that just says it's a carbon tells us we've got a carbon right here, just somewhere. Call that the middle. Row two says we have a hydrogen. And relative to atom one, the hydrogen is 1.09 angstroms away. So rather than saying where in the XYZ coordinates, that doesn't really matter. All that we really care about is that this hydrogen is 1.09 angstroms away. So who cares where the origin of your XYZ graph is? It doesn't matter. All that we really care about is where the atoms are. So, and that's, if you only have two atoms, that's all you need to define your, your molecule. If you have two atoms, all you need is to say, how close are they? So we could actually do a, write the Z matrix for a, a dime molecular system real or a diatomic molecule really easily. So let's say if we were talking about O2, you want to know what the Z matrix looks like, what the coordinates look like for oxygen gas. We would start in row one. We could just say row in row one, it's an oxygen. Row two, it's going to be another oxygen relative to atom one. And then our third column would just be whatever the distance is between two oxygens in, o2, in, in uh, molecular oxygen. O2 bond length is 1.208 angstroms. So Right there, that's a. This is a geometry of O2 of molecular oxygen. All you need is for molecule one is oxygen, molecule two is oxygen, and relative to atom one, it's 1.208 angstroms away. It doesn't really matter in what direction the other second oxygen is, right? These things are symmetrical. So it doesn't really matter if it's pointing out towards you or it's pointing down. Or as far as the energy goes, those are all identical, right? So what this is, if we were taking this and drawing the molecule, we'd say, okay, I shouldn't have cho chosen oxygen because it just looks like circles. 
we have nucleus one is oxygen and then 1.208 angstroms away is nucleus two. And I can draw that one in any direction as long as it's 1.208 angstroms away. What happens when we add a, a third atom though? Let's, what if we had, um, let's say we're looking at a simple molecule like sulfur dioxide, SO2. Well, we can say, okay, atom one is the sulfur, atom two is an oxygen. And I'm just gonna say, okay, make up a distance. It's probably about 1.6 angstroms away. If I add the third oxygen in, I can still say relative to atom one, it's 1.6 angstroms away. But that's not all the information I need, right? What other piece of information do I need to say where all three atoms are? The distance between the two oxygens? The, you could either do the distance between the two oxygens. Um, usually, we do that in the form of an angle, a bond angle. So let me go back to the screen share. When you add a third atom in, we have to define a bond angle. And so what this would allow us to do is to say something like, okay, I'm going to go back to, to drawing um, this molecule. So if we have a carbon in the middle, and then you've got one hydrogen, it's 1.09 angstroms away. The next hydrogen we add on there, it could still be 1.09 angstroms away. but we need to specify how close these are to each other. And so that we do it as an angle. So, and if you look at the units here or what this, this graph, this sample geometry is, it says 109.5 degrees. Does that number sound familiar to you? What is that from? Just uh, molecular geometries and stuff, right? Like a yeah. plane or something? Or... So which what molecular geometry gave us something, a bond angle of 109.5? Maybe linear? That wouldn't be 109, right? Linear would be 180. Uh, tetrahedral, maybe? Tetrahedral. Yeah, so trigonal planar would be 120 degrees. Tetrahedral, tetrahedral is 109 degrees from each other. So that says, okay, our, our next hydrogen that we add on here, it's still gonna be 109 angstroms away from the carbon, but it's also going to be One hundred and nine point five degrees from the other hydrogen. All right. So these first ones are a little difficult to visualize, but doable, right? What was it about a tetrahedral structure and having four electron groups 
that made things get trickier than trigonal, planar, and linear. You guys remember what uh, what you thought about molecular geometries back in Gen Chem? So linear was easy because it was just 180 degrees, right? It was a straight line. Trigonal planar was easy because it was flat. Tetrahedral structures started to get weird because we had three dimensions to work in. So this last column is going to be the trickiest to visualize, and it's what's called the dihedral angle. Uh, and I'm going to go to the A lab drawing here for an example of dihedral angle. So if we think of R as being the distance between two atoms, that's our column, column one and two. I guess two and three. The um, bond angle is going to be the next variable we have to add. The last variable we have to add, though, is what's called the dihedral angle. And the dihedral angle is going to be if, if your bond angle is in a flat plane because it's got three points, x, y, and z, your dihedral angle is how far up do you have to rotate it? So it's, it's very similar to spherical coordinates. Remember, in, um, we, what class, what math class do you guys cover spherical coordinates in? Not, not ringing any bells. So in spherical coordinates, a spherical coordinate system, you needed, you need the distance from the origin, the angle away from zero radians, and then how far up do you rotate is the third variable you have to plug in. So polar coordinates just look like if you had a polar coordinate system, you would need, you would have R is your distance from the origin. And then there's your, your angle. In spherical coordinates, you also would need an angle that says how far up does it rotate. And that's kind of what this dihedral angle is. So it says, okay, you've defined a plane by saying this is X, this is Y, and this is this is Z, or I guess A, B, and C. And then your last piece of information is how far up does it rotate? All right, so this is going to take some practice um, to get the hang of this. Luckily, That program MacMol PLT will allow you to build your own Z matrices. All right, yeah, calculus. That's calculus sounds about right for spherical coordinates. Maybe um, algebra too, but I think al our college algebra is probably starts just with Cartesian X, Y, and Z. Um, if we want to build an atom here, we can actually do that by plugging in our individual atoms. Uh, and actually, I want the yeah coordinates. And coordinate type would be in Z matrix. And so what this allows us to do is basically say, OK, I'm going to add a new atom, and I'm going to make it a carbon. And then you can say, OK, let's add another atom. Let's make it a hydrogen. And relative to atom one, it's come on. All right, hang on. This has changed slightly. Delete that one too. Start from the beginning. Carbon, hydrogen, one, 
Why is it not letting me? Well, this is not what it's supposed to be doing. Good news is, is that we can do this by hand as well. The easiest way to do this um, is actually going to be to pick our atoms and just do this by hand. Um, this assignment, though, is going to have you use these approximate bond lengths to build a Z matrix by hand for these and then check it by typing it into um, MacMul PLT. There we go. I don't know why it was behaving funny. Um, and basically, as you add new atoms in here, so we did, what if we did a simple molecule like um, formaldehyde? We know that Lewis thought structure of formaldehyde, we know about what the geometry should look like. So formaldehyde is going to look like look like this, right? So we have a carbon, two hydrogens, and an oxygen. And that table of common bond lengths tells us roughly how far away all of these should be from each other. Um, so all of our carbon hydrogen single bonds are going to be 1.09 atoms away from each other. I don't know why it's very, being very picky about what it lets me edit or not, to double click in just the right spot. Um, so if our overall bond angle is going to be, if we have a trigonal planar system here, what should our bond angle be between the two, two hydrogens, roughly? How many degrees apart are everything in a trigonal planar system? It's flat, so we're only in two dimensions. 360 degrees, and we need to divide that into three equal sections, right? So it should be 120. Man, this is really fighting me here. All right, well, I'm just going to do it in Excel then. Um, and then we'll draw it out. Um, and this program does allow us to uh, plug things in, copy and paste things. So column one, we had a carbon. Then we had a hydrogen that was relative to carbon one, 1.09 angstroms away. We had another hydrogen and relative to carb the carbon one to atom one, it was also 1.09 angstroms away. But the difference is now we need to say what their angle is relative to each other. So we say, all right, so atom three, is 1.09 angstroms from carbon one 
And it's also relative to atom two is going to be 120 degrees away. Right. And if I could get these to this is really annoying to me. I have no idea why this is not working. We'll exit out of here and we'll try it again in a minute. Um, so, but if we're drawing that by hand on the board, the coordinates that are drawn there, we have carbon in the middle, hydrogen over here, 1.09 angstroms away, and hydrogen over here also 1.09 angstroms away and 120 degrees away from each other. So the last atom that we need to add is the oxygen atom. So we'd add another oxygen here we'd say, okay, relative to atom one, and then we could look at this table and say, okay, a carbonyl bond is usually 1.23 angstroms. So we could say 1.23 angstroms away from, from carbon one. And relative to atom one, or for, to atom two, we don't want it to just be 120 degrees away. It would need to go another 120, right? So to get from, from this hydrogen all the way around to the oxygen, that's not 120 degrees, now that's 240 degrees. Or you could put in negative 120 if you wanted. So that's saying, okay, start at the carbon, go 109, uh, 1.09 angstroms in, in one direction, and then rotate 240 degrees around. And the last piece of this, though, is we have to say, in addition to everything else, if we want it to, to tell it that it needs to be a flat molecule that's supposed to be planar, we have to say that relative to the first three atoms, relative to the first three atoms, if we want it to be flat, that means we don't want it to stick up at all, right? And so we would say our last, angle, our dihedral angle is going to be zero degrees. We're not going to lift it up off of the, the board at all. If we plugged in like 60 degrees there, what that would be saying is for this oxygen is that you start at the carbon, you go 1.09 angstroms here, rotate 240 degrees around the carbon, and then make it stick out 60 degrees. So we don't want that. We want this to be planar. This is a trigonal planar system we're trying to draw here. So we would say we want that that, that rotation, that dihedral rotation into the board or out of the board, it's going to be zero. And... I'm going to try this one more time.
no, we're going to delete this. We're just going to, there must be something I'm missing. This is what happens when I don't double check things right before class. Um, the good news is, is it will let you um, copy and paste if we're in the right format. So we should be able to do something No. Well, we'll just build it by hand and then uh, I'll show you how to build it by hand and then we'll check the Z matrix to see if the one that we wrote matches. So um, if we're going to build one of these inputs by hand, we usually wanna see the build tools, which is just a uh, periodic table. And if we're in edit mode, if you click up at the top to go into edit mode, anywhere you click, you're just going to add another carbon atom. We don't actually want all of that. So we'll control alt to select everything and just delete it. So if we start with coordinate. You also might notice that on this sex, this periodic table here, as a section for coordination number and number of lone pairs. That's going to allow you to add things in a very specific way. Coordination number means how many atoms are attached to it, how many electron or how many bonded atoms are there. And number of lone pairs is exactly what it sounds like. So for the carbon that we're starting for formaldehyde, we want a coordinate, coordination number of three because it has three things attached with no lone pairs. So when you click, now we get a carbon atom that has these three red sticks coming out of it. And those red sticks are just places we can put more atoms where we can add things. So the next one we built was our first hydrogen, right? And we made our first hydrogen go towards the right. So we'll do the same thing here. And all you have to do is once you select hydrogen, you click right on the ends of those red rods and it adds your hydrogen in there. And then the second one we added was we added another hydrogen here. And then we're going to add an oxygen in the last spot. Now, oxygen's coordination number is just going to be one. It's still going to have two lone pairs. And when we add it in there, we get a carbon oxygen double bond, which is not exactly what we want. Uh, it doesn't really matter what the bonds look like, but if we wanted to change that, you can just right click right on the bond. You have to get right on there, um, but then you can say bond order double. Right, and so by being careful about our coordination number and picking their lone pairs properly, it actually will do a lot of the bond angles for us. And now if we look at the coordinates in Z matrix form, we get something really close to what we had on the, on the board. And now it's letting me change these. If I wanted to change any of these, Now, when I hit enter, it'll adjust everything there. So if I plug in exactly what we had written on our Excel sheet, they're using a different carbon hydrogen bond length than what we had as the default, but that doesn't really make a difference. It's just gonna be how far, how close these hydrogens are to each other. Um, we get the same molecule that we built on, that we drew on the board, except now, we can click and drag and see it in three dimensions. When it's something flat, that's pretty straightforward, right? Well, at least it would be, it's not too tricky to just draw it flat on a board. Um, but if you actually want to show things, something in three dimensions, it takes some practice building these things. And for whatever reason now, it's letting me, change all of these however I want. So we could plug in the actual numbers that we wanted to start with 1.09, 1.09, not that it really matters. 
120 degrees from each other. And we said that our, it was 1.23. And anytime you make a change in your, your coordinate editor here, it'll reflect it over on this side, oops. It'll also do things like let you click and drag. Um, highly recommend get your fingers used to sitting in control Z on your whatever um, the undo shortcut is on a Mac. Um, because there's gonna be a lot of times you change something or click and drag something the wrong way and accidentally, oh, I added another oxygen. Uh, control Z just gets rid of it. All right, let me see if that's everything to kind of get you started. So what you're actually going to be working on is either in a spreadsheet or uh, on a text document, you're going to write Z matrix coordinates for methane. So similar to the way we just did here, except methane's tetrahedral. And then you're going to plug that into MACMO PLT, plug in the exact numbers that you wrote down and see if you get the right molecule out. So for instance, if I wanted to, um, I'm not gonna do methane because that's part of your assignment, but if I wanted to do um, say ammonia, NH3, start by doing nitrogen, See if it'll actually work this time, it should. And then we could check, okay, nitrogen to hydrogen. Of course, it's not listed. Let's call it 1.09, the same. And sometimes, maybe this is what it, the issue is it needed to be. I have no idea why it won't let me change it now, but it will once I build it the right way. Um, all right, so we'll do it that we'll do it that way then. Build the molecule the way you think it should, or write out the geometry in Excel. Then build the molecule in MacMol and make sure that the Z matrix coordinates in MacMol PLT match what you actually drew it out as. So that might look like, anytime you lose one of your windows, because maximum PLT does, you will lose your windows sometimes because they wind up being a lot of them open. Just hide it and then have it show it again and it'll pop back up in the front. So if I wanted to draw ammonia with one lone pair, I'd add it on here and then cl click my hydrogens. You get something that looks like this. And then I can go over to sub window, click on coordinates, click on Z matrix, and see if that matches what you um, wrote down it was supposed to look like. If it doesn't, make it look like the numbers you wrote down and see if, you, if it's identical. There's more than one way to write a Z matrix usually. So the way that you drew it, you, you wrote it out might not be the only way. For instance, this has a negative 120 dihedral angle, but that if I put a regular 120 dihedral angle, that works just as well. Or if I put you know, 240 as the dihedral angle, that also gives us the same molecule, right? So there more than, there's more than one way to write these out. So I want you to try doing it by hand and then make it look the right way in here. It's one of my favorite things about MacMol. It's a little tiny quality of life thing, but if you click and drag and throw it, you can make it rotate and it'll just keep rotating indefinitely, which is kind of fun. Um, it looks really impressive when you're showing, showing somebody this and then you can just have it set it to automatically rotate in whatever angle you want. Um, it's the little things, right? All right, so then, so you're drawing methane and ethanol. 
in in a Z matrix and then building it and seeing and making your numbers match up and see if you drew did it correctly. Um, and you're going to actually, from MacMul PLT, you can actually save these geometries. And this is part of what you guys are going to submit for this lab, is when you when you get it built the way you want it to be, you can go up to file and hit export. And you want it, you can export it just as a as a image file if all you care about is the picture. But if you want to save the coordinates, you would hit MDL mole file. So you want to export it as as that type of file. And so I would I would recommend just having a folder on your desktop for right now where you're just going to save a bunch of these things and you're going to send them or submit them all for this assignment. Um, so if I saved it as 01 test, wherever I, of course, I didn't actually look where I just saved it. Um, you can't just hit save though, because save tries to save the configuration here. You want to, you actually have to hit export. So we'll do 01 test again, and I'll put it on my desktop. So they didn't pick a mole file, left it as a bitmap. So what you're actually saving when you do that Get out of here. That's what I want. If you open this in a text editor, you'll see that it actually saves all your information as Cartesian coordinates. And so you have all of the information you need from this. And it just allows me a .mol file means I can open it with, where's open with? What am I missing? Oh, it's up at the top. Um, you can open it with MacMul PLT and it'll, it'll open it exactly as you had it saved. Right, so this is just the, the, the format that we save these things in is in .mol files. All right, and I accidentally got myself into a situation where I had a new desktop, desktop which I wasn't aware that's something that Windows 10 does. Were you able to still see what I was looking at when I was opening it up the .mol file or not? Okay. Never know how all these new features are going to play with each other. Zoom and new updates to Windows and who knows. All right. Let's get out of there. So you're building your geometries, saving them as a .mol file, um, and exporting, or sorry, exporting as a .mol file. The other thing you're going to do is you're going to download a .mol file of cholesterol from MolView. MolView will actually give you .mol files that we can then open in MacMol PLT and, and edit however we want. So if we go to MolView and look up something, so I'm, I won't do cholesterol, but let's say, well, caffeine is, is the one that it opens by default. Um, but so I want, let's say I wanted to save that. If you come over to tools, you can go to export mole file, MOL. And so you can save that or you can app open it directly with MacMul PLT. And now we've got something in three dimensions. That's, that's our structure of caffeine. So mole view plays nicely with MacMul as well. And now we can do things like, okay, well, what if I wanted to change this oxygen to a sulfur? Well, you can, as long as you come up here and make sure that you're in edit mode, 
you can right click on any of these and change them to whatever you want. You can pick whatever atom you want. You say, okay, change this to a sulfur. And now when you click and drag and rotate it around, we've got a sulfur attached here instead of an oxygen. So that the second part of your assignment is, is to use mole view to look up the structure of cholesterol and then change these the two areas that have these red boxes you're going to change the oxygen to a, a chlorine and you're going to change the isopropyl group at the end to a t-butyl group right so most of this assignment is going to be playing around with mole view learning how it works finding the idiosyncrasies like it won't let you randomly won't let you change the z matrix when you want it to um and trying to make it build the molecules you want it to have right so it's pretty uh, it's pretty friendly when in doubt right click on something to see what it does if you accidentally click somewhere and add something you don't want or accidentally click and drag your carbon somewhere you don't want just hit control z Right, so I'm going to turn you guys loose on this assignment. Give it a go, see what you can do. I'll be here if you have any questions. And we'll go from there. Any questions right off the bat? I know I'm kind of dropping you in the deep end, or at least it feels that way, but. Just play around with the program, try and make, make those molecules you want. I think I got enough to get going here. Thanks. All right, good. Go for it. 